This is Science 2034. 20 years ago, the Science Coalition was formed to strengthen federal support for basic scientific and engineering research. We tell the stories of what federally funded research has made possible and what will be reality 20 years from now. Our guest, Samuel Stanley, the president of Stony Brook University. So we're really in the midst of an extraordinary paradox, where I think the opportunities and tools for discovery in science have never been more powerful. But the outlook for aspiring researchers is really very concerning. I think the reason is multifactorial, but the stagnation of research funding, the accumulation of more senior researchers in tenured positions, the nature of peer review, particularly with the reliance on track record on funding decisions, all of these contribute to a really difficult environment for young researchers. And I guess what illustrates it more than anything else is the fact that the average age of a first-time R01 recipient, and these are really the key grants from NIH, is now 42. That's a six-year increase from the 1980s. I think we're effectively reducing the opportunities for the next generation to contribute to science, both in terms of the number of investigator positions available and in the duration of their independent career. We know that individuals in their 30s and 40s are often at their most creative, and a system that relegates them to junior positions is going to rob us of that innovation and creativity. And the long path to becoming an independent investigator discourages bright people from choosing a career in research. I think young researchers really do bring something different to the table. I think they can be more creative. I think they're more likely to develop new or innovative approaches, including higher risk ideas. And I think they may be less bound by conventional wisdom and more willing to strike out on new paths. I think a number of things need to change. Uh, if we really want to have a new generation of researchers who are going to have an impact over the next 20 years. I think we need systemic changes in how grants are evaluated. We need to change our expectations for younger faculty in terms of teaching and service, how we provide appropriate parental leave, how we incent successful established investigators maybe to mentor postdoctoral fellows and help them succeed in their first independent award. And we need more mentors and more young investigator awards. One of the things we're really excited about at Stony Brook is the fact that we established what we're calling the Discovery Prize. And it's a prize that funds the most innovative and high-risk research from talented young investigators. The prize is funded by the Stony Brook Foundation and provides up to $250,000 for a single PI, uh, spendable over two to three years. It provides both an opportunity for young investigators, but also demonstrates our institutional commitment to innovation and supporting new faculty that have high-risk, high-reward projects. We're also creating a stronger and infrastructure for help in submitting grants to make sure new faculty can produce a competitive grant the first time. So I think we're not alone in the problems faced by young investigators. This isn't a unique problem to the U.S., and I think it's worldwide in extent. But I think we probably haven't done enough. I look at what the European Union is doing with their Horizons 2020 program. Uh, they're offering two new types of research grants to early career scientists, depending on their career stage. Um, and these starting grants uh, are significant. They're in the range of a million uh, uh, euros uh, per uh, recipient. Uh, they're going to give 300 to 400 of them. And I think we need to emulate that program. I, I think providing this kind of support to young investigators early at their career is really critical. And in some sense, de-risks uh, the investment for universities. If universities know that young investigators are going to be funded early in their career, it makes it easier to give the startup packages and easier to support them as they develop. So this type of program that the EU is doing, as well as other programs that other countries are doing, are things I think that we need to emulate and really push in the U.S. So there's a lot of exciting things happening at Stony Brook, I think, in the area of research, but I'm, I'm just going to focus on one. Um, there's work that just was published by Lorna Rolls, who's one of our neurobiologists and her colleagues, that takes a look at ways in which you could enhance or down-regulate uh, uh, memories. And they've done work on mice where they found that a small infusion of acetylcholine, a neurotransmitter, in a very 
particular part of the brain can actually enhance a memory. But taking away that neurotransmitter, again, in a very small part of the brain, can actually downregulate memories as well. So if you think of diseases like depression or post-traumatic stress syndrome, the ability to augment happy memories, to make us remember things that are good and make us feel better, and also the ability to downplay memories, including things that could stimulate or uh, could really augment post-traumatic stress syndrome. The ability to downregulate those memories as well, I think is very important. So this kind of research, this kind of tool that really Really could make a difference in people's lives, uh, but was high risk, but as well as high reward. That's the kind of research I think we need to continue to encourage. And that's why it's so important that we have young investigators and have them engaged uh, in research.